One of the most difficult concepts to understand in sleep medicine is the mechanism for central sleep apnea. In this presentation, we're going to understand and review the mechanisms for this syndrome. Let's first consider the essential controls of breathing when we're awake. Uh, we have behavioral controls that allow us to take a breath uh, upon a um, desire to do so, and also we have the ability to hold our breath irrespective of other physiologic uh, factors. As depicted, these chemoreceptors are located in the carotid bodies, which are sensitive to levels of uh, PO2, as well as PCO2 and pH, and also in the medulla, which is more sensitive to pH and specifically CO2. As a result of the physiologic measurements that are monitored by these chemoreceptors, a signal then is delivered to the lung and the respiratory muscles to maintain ventilation that will result in a PCO2 between a range of 36 and 44 tor. Generally, this level of 40, known as eupnea, represents the homeostatic level of ventilation that results in that PCO2. A level of a PCO2 less than 36 will be low enough that there will not be any respiratory drive on the basis of these levels. The distance between the PCO2 of 40, known as eupnea, and the apnea threshold is known as the CO2 reserve. So while awake, we can actually, by behavioral controls, regulate uh, some of the metabolic uh, parameters that will affect our respiratory drive. For instance, if we want to win the underwater dive contest, uh, we can hyperventilate and drive our PCO2 down to 20 or 25, and this will allow us to stay underwater longer um, because we hyperventilated, it will allow the period of 60 to 90 seconds of hypoventilation to allow us to uh, not take a breath um, when others may need to take their breath in, in 30 seconds. Uh, eventually, the increasing PCO2 and perhaps even the hypoxia will make it too uncomfortable to hold the breath any longer, uh, but we have actually, um, by hyperventilating, allowed ourselves to hypoventilate for that period of time. Now, what happens to our respiratory drive when we fall asleep? And uh, the first item to be aware of is that we lose our behavioral control. And we are now relying on those physiologic parameters and our central control. During sleep also, we are going to be having sleep stage dependent issues that will include the CO2 reserve that will be more um, widened in, in REM sleep, and during non-REM sleep, this uh, CO2 reserve will narrow, making us more uh, susceptible to have apnea because of the short distance from the CO2 of 40 to the apnea threshold that in non-REM sleep may be higher than 36, perhaps even 39. Now it's important to consider that central sleep apnea can occur because of either hypoventilation or hyperventilation. And in considering hypoventilation, obviously we've lost our behavioral control and our uh, blunting of the central controls can result from conditions such as uh, the use of opiates, um, central nervous system disease, as well as neuromuscular disease that can lead to hypoventilation and central apnea or central hypopnea. A more common mechanism for central sleep apnea is one that involves hyperventilation. And in this regard, it's important to understand a concept known as loop gain. And this includes two elements, the first known as plant gain, where the lung itself, uh, based on the uh, stimulation and afferent receptors in the lung, can lead to hyperventilation that will drive the PCO2 down, potentially even below the apnea threshold. 
Also, the central uh, element to this is that controller gain, which means that up in the brainstem, there can be an amplified response to PCO2 that will result in a signal being sent back to the respiratory muscles and the lung to increase minute ventilation. As a result of either of these elements of loop gain, let's take a look at the impact of the PCO2 on the increased minute ventilation that occurs from these factors. Uh, with the PCO2 uh, being driven down from either plant gain or controller gain, we will have a reduction in the PCO2 known as the uh, CO2 threshold overshoot that will result in apnea. Consider now a patient with congestive heart failure. That patient may have increased plant gain because of the pulmonary edema that may be causing increase in the pulmonary stretch receptors, uh, leading to increased minute ventilation, and also the hypoxia that may result in causing increase in respiratory drive and uh, amplifying control or gain. There's also an important concept in patients with congestive heart failure that further complicates this and destabilizes respiratory drive. And that is that with reduced ejection fraction, the time from the blood leaving the heart until reaching the medulla will be uh, increased. This increased transit time may be prolonged from 10 seconds in a normal patient to 25 or 30 seconds in a patient with congestive heart failure. And this transit time will be prolonged and therefore the signal will be late. And this will confuse the respiratory center and further destabilize respiratory drive and lead to a uh, inconsistent uh, pattern of uh, signal to the lung and the respiratory muscles uh, in terms of respiratory effort. So now the medulla is seeing a signal that is going to be, in terms of the PCO2, reflecting a effort that reflects what the lung did 20 or 25 seconds ago. So in the initial part of this, the PCO2 may initially be 40, and then based on hyperventilation, that PCO2 is driven down to the apnea threshold. Uh, the medulla then will uh, not have any signal to breathe for the next 10 seconds, and uh, while below the apnea threshold, there will be a central apnea. Of course, with the return and elevation in the PCO2, there will be a gradual rise uh, in this uh, PCO2, and then with the ventilation that occurred uh, again 20 seconds earlier, there will be another reduction in the PCO2. This results in a very classic airflow that is measured uh, in looking at a patient with congestive heart failure that has chain stoke breathing. Corresponding to the red lines uh, of the PCO2, there will be a flow pattern corresponding that will be a decrescendo airflow pattern. And during the period that you see the uh, red lines have dropped below the apnea threshold, there will be the central apnea portion of the chain stoke breathing. And this generally is uh, approximately 10 seconds. Following that, there will be a crescendo in the airflow, followed by a decrescendo. This chain stoke event typically lasts for 50 seconds, and there will be an element of this that is generally the central apnea that is approximately 10 seconds in duration. Another common form of central sleep apnea seen in clinical practice is that known as PAP emergent central sleep apnea, or complex sleep apnea. And this is a phenomenon where patients who are on PAP therapy will develop central apnea um, upon treating their obstructive apnea. And this is explained by the fact that the PAP therapy has opened the airway. This generally will increase minute ventilation, and this will drive the PCO2 down below the apnea threshold, or CO2 overshoot. Uh, there is a conception that among uh, many clinicians that the uh, change to bilevel therapy will um, obviate this uh, uh, central apnea, and in fact, it often will make it worse depending on the settings of the bilevel therapy that may cause even more in terms of uh, increased minute ventilation. 
Uh, this phenomenon of papemergent apnea also may be in part explained by the fragmented sleep with an arousal. The arousal can occur because of the discomfort from the mask uh, or because of the pressure itself and a gasp or a hyperpnea will lead to a further drop in the PCO2 that may further contribute to the CO2 overshoot that may lead to a central apnea. This is most commonly seen in patients who have high loop gain. And it's very difficult to predict which patients will develop PAP emergent central sleep apnea. And uh, the development of central apnea may occur in as many as 10% of patients who are placed on PAP therapy. And the explanation is the CO2 overshoot from the very therapy that's used to treat the obstructive apnea. As a result of this, let's take a look at the PCO2 and keep in mind that if the patient is in non-REM sleep, this will be even more dramatically a potential problem. And uh, if the PCO2 is maintained in the uh, uh, range here slightly above the apnea threshold, uh, the features noted above uh, will cause the uh, PCO2 to drop below the apnea threshold and cause uh, the overshoot that will lead to the central apnea. And uh, uh, understanding this, the therapy often is to try to reduce the respiratory drive and therefore the central sleep apnea that develops from PAP therapy. I hope that the review of central sleep apnea has increased your understanding of the mechanisms uh, for this syndrome and also will lead to understanding uh, better applications of therapy for central sleep apnea in caring for your patients. Um, more information on this can be seen on the uh, website at pulmonaryandsleepacademy.com. Thank you for your attention.